Good. Thank you. Morning. This is Carl with No Coast Fab. Uh, on episode three. The real three. There it is. We're going to narrow a Ford 9 inch. So, grab your coffee. Sit back. Let's get to it. All right. First thing we're going to want to do is we're going to establish how much we're going to narrow it. In our case, our width is already set. Our pinion was already centered in the tunnel. So we're narrowing to accommodate a different set of wheels and tires. And maybe just to skosh more, because if you look in here, see that shiny spot right there? This was rubbing a little bit with the wheel and tire combo that was on it. We're going from an 18 by eight to a 20 by 10. So all we really need to make up for is that little bit that we're rubbing, which it's only rubbing on one side. So rear end is probably a little bit out of square, not a big deal. But anyway, all we're doing is changing to accommodate the different wheel size and the different backspace. So backspace, I'm sure most of you know, but I'll show, I'll show this for those of you that don't. It's how far in your mounting surface is from the back side of the wheel. So how far this mounting surface is from the inside edge of your wheel. And you can see, maybe, there we go. You can see we're four and a half. It's not exactly four and a half because I'm sitting on the tire instead of on the wheel. So, it makes it pretty easy. Our wheel is an eight inch wheel with a four and a half inch backspace, which leaves us three and a half on the other side. The wheel we're going to is a 10 inch wheel with a five and a half inch backspace, which leaves us four and a half on the other side. So if you look at that, 3.5 versus 4.5, we got to take an inch off of each side. So two inches. Uh, I'm going to take, I'm going to take an extra half inch per side just so that we know that we're not rubbing and it's easy enough to throw in like a quarter inch spacer if we have to, to get it to look right. I don't think we'll need to, I think it's gonna be fine. So we'll be taking, well, yeah, whatever I just said. I'll have to think about it again before I get it right, but three inches off, call it three. So now we just gotta get this thing tore down. All right, we got our nine inch tour part. Now it's time to cut off all the perches, brackets, everything else that's been left on there. I'll show you real quick. There's a lot of them on this guy.
they just kept adding and adding and adding and adding and adding. So basically you have three choices. You can hit it with cutoff wheel, cut everything off, grind it down smooth. That's gonna be your best bet to keep heat down. You can torch it. Which, not a bad idea. Or the plasma cutter. This is probably what I'm gonna use because it's a little bit faster and I hate grinding. I really hate grinding. Be careful when you're doing it though. Keep in mind, the nine inch, for the most part, uses a 188 wall tube, axle tube. And so that's 3 16 It's not a very thick tube. It's gonna be pretty susceptible to bending, well, not bending, warping. So you wanna try and keep your heat down to a minimum. Uh, if you're gonna use a plasma or a torch, be careful not to chew into the tube. Leave a little extra, do some grinding at the end. We all hate grinding, but in this case, it's probably worth it, just a little bit. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll try and show you how to plasma gouge a little bit. If you don't know how to do that or you've never seen it, if you have a plasma cutter and you don't know how to do that, it's probably something you should know. It makes cleanup go a lot faster on a lot of things. So um, I've been playing with welding footage. That one's kind of tricky to get in focus and clean. We'll try it with the, uh, we'll try plasma gouging. Maybe that'll work better. Well, so let's get after it. All right, we got the plasma cutter all set up. We're gonna start knocking all these brackets off. Now you'll see, I'm gonna leave a little extra on every one of these. I'm not gonna take it down tight to the tube. That's where you normally mess up and you'll start gouging into stuff, leave a little extra. The reason for getting all these out of the way is just to make it easier to move that housing around to deal with them, to get them all cleaned up. We're not worried about getting it close. We're not, we're not worried about gouging things down to where we don't have much grinding to do. So just kind of get everything knocked out of the way. Now, if you pay attention, I'm going from side to side. I'll cut something off one side and then I'll move over to the other side. And the reason we're doing this is just to keep the heat down on the tubes, just to help just to help with any type of warping. I think I have, I'm running this in five times speed. The whole, this whole operation took maybe, I don't know, six, seven minutes. It was pretty quick. Here we're getting that other uh, track bar bracket out of the way. Now we're just down to the leaf brackets. Now on the outside there, I left about three quarters on the outside because by the time you angle the plasma cutter down in there to get it any tighter, it just gets too close to that tube. So it's easier to deal with it from the inside so we don't have that funny angle. And there we go. All right, here we're gonna switch the plasma cutter over from cut to gouge. It's in cut now. We're gonna flip it down to gouge. The air pressure is gonna be way too high from cut, so you're gonna have to adjust that down. We've already changed our consumables to our gouge specific consumables. Now that we have our air pressure set, we can put the amperage where we think it needs to be to get gouging. Okay, now we're gonna start plasma gouging. Now with plasma gouging, where we reduce the air pressure and changed our consumables, it lets it makes that arc a little bit softer so you're not cutting all the way through. I'm a little hot through this video. This is the first one I did. I make a couple heat changes as we go, but I'm still actually a little bit hot. And what we're doing is it's more like an air arc. We're digging that weld out and looking for a crack. Once we get down to a crack, we know the weld's gone and we can get rid of it. And you'll see once you get that out of the way, I think I turned it down a little bit more right here. And then we can just knock the tops out of those welds and we get down to where it's nearly flush. It's gonna take only a couple seconds worth of grinding to get this down to where it's just right. There we are. I'm just gonna wash the top of this plate so I can show you a little better what I mean when I say gouging softens up the arc. If you watch closely, you can see that arc's actually bending. It's not protruding straight out of the plasma cutter. And this is what lets you get into those cracks without getting into your parent material. So, just a little fast. All right, we got everything cleaned up. Uh, we're ready to start cutting a narrow one. Uh, thought maybe we'd talk about nine inch for just a second. I'm not a guru. I don't know all the details by any means, but I at least help spread, spread some bad information. Uh, I want to say they came out in 1957-ish, somewhere in there. I think 57 is right. Your early nine inch housings are gonna be round here on the back. Somewhere in the 60s, they went to a more form-fitting rear cover. And that was just to keep the fluid tighter on the gears, a little bit better lubrication. 
you're really only going to find two different variations. You're going to have your small bearing 9-inch and your big bearing 9-inch. Your small bearings are all going to be a 28 spline. Your big bearings are going to be a 31 spline. Let me get these up here so you can see the difference in size from the 28 to the 31. So if you're at the scrapyard looking for a 9-inch, the easiest way to tell if you've got a 31 spline is it's going to have these divots. The 28 spline won't have that. The 28 spline is going to be kind of recessed right there. It'll have kind of a D shape. And that's how you know it'll be a 28 spline, not a 31. Or vice versa. Another way you can tell is on the end of the axle tube here. Can you see that one? They're going to come off smooth. Where your big bearing, it's going to bell up a little bit right there. The small bearings are like 2.835, big bearings 3.150, if I remember right. So, uh, for setup, our jig is an inch and a half bar here. And then you have some bushings. You're going to have a bushing on each end. It'll ride in this bearing surface on the end of the tube. And two more bushings that ride inside of this carrier here. And they just neck it down to this inch and a half. Now you can buy, you can buy a setup kit. I think they're six, 700 bucks, something like that. Uh, I went looking for mine and I can't find it. It's lost forever. Uh, I probably lost it when I moved. So I'm gonna make one. If you have access to a lathe or you have a buddy that's a machinist or anything like that, it's pretty easy to set up. Any, uh, any of your like industrial hydraulic shops are gonna have this stuff laying around. This is actually an inch and a half hydraulic shaft, which makes it nice because it has the chrome on it. So everything's gonna spin real nice. And then these guys, these are just solid aluminum. They keep these in hydraulic shops for building like spacers and shit like that. So that's all stuff you can pick up in your local hydraulic shop. If you got a buddy that's a machine and he can spin it down for you. Uh, you can build your own for 150, 200 bucks if you can get the machining done. Uh, I'm using a spare housing. This is not the housing that came out. The housing that came out is right there. So if you're going to keep your original gears, you want to find yourself a setup housing. You don't want to pull out your used gears unless you have a way to make sure that they go back in exactly the same as they came out. Once those gears get ran and get a wear pattern put back or wore into them, if you pull them out and set them back in and they aren't in that exact same wear pattern that they were before, they're going to wear out fast. So if you plan on doing new gears, you can use your housing, no problem. But if you plan on reusing your original gears that you pulled out, you need to find yourself a setup housing to do this in. Uh, you know, that's, oh, no, nope, that's not all I can think of. We still got a little bit more. You can see we're shortening this an inch and a half per side. So I just put inch and a half tape around it and that's what I'll mark off of. If you're doing something other than a standard size, like this is an easy one, uh, spray your housing with die chem. This is a good one here. And then when you're marking your lines, you can do it a couple ways. I mean, you can use dividers, calipers, uh, scribe, or your carbide tip scribe. And what this die chem will do is it's gonna turn it blue It'll turn your, well, here. See how it turned that nice and blue? And then when you take your scribe and mark it, you're not gonna be able to see that on camera, but it's gonna make that mark stand out like neon. So you won't lose it. And then uh, just be careful when you're cutting, make sure everything stays as, make sure your cuts stay as square as you possibly can keep them. Another way you could do it, is you could just lop that off. You can order new ends, put them on. Uh, 
when I got this car on his way out the door, he told me, oh, by the way, I need you to narrow this and I don't have, I don't have the time to schedule the way all parts show up. So Louie, you're a bastard and this is what you get. So let's uh, move on, we'll get to cutting this thing and start putting it back together. <laughs> to start cutting you can see i took that die cam and i painted right over my tape tube everything that way when i peeled the tape off it left me two nice crisp lines to to cut to uh, i like using the cutoff wheel for this because i can cut right to that line and it's almost dead on every time i'm only cutting the inside because i'm going to take those outer pieces to the lathe and i'm going to part them and then put a bevel on them for welding on the lathe if you don't if you don't have a lathe to do that Cut your outside first and then move move on and cut the inside like I'm doing here. That way you're not fighting that outside piece. It's not flopping around loose on the bench. It's nice and solid. So we'll get these cut off and then I'll uh, show you some beveling. Okay. Got everything cut out that we want to cut out on these ends. I'm putting a 60 degree bevel on it and let's see if I can get it to where you can see it. I'm leaving about just under an eighth inch root face on that, which should be just about right to burn through with the TIG to get 100% penetration. So then you want to set up your jig. This is going to be like any other time you set up a rear end. You want to keep track of your caps left and right, normally just a punch, one on one two and two. You want these to stay in the same position anytime you take them on and off the rear end. So let me get set up a little better and we'll continue. I'm going to take your bushes. Get them on your bar. Make sure that your bar is moving free and that it turns nice. Everything is going to line up off these two right here. And we're good. So now you take the bar out, drop the housing in, hold it in, move on to the ends. All right, you can see we got our bar installed. We got our adapters in to the bells. Everything's lined up. See the bar running through there. So now we need to see how straight this thing is. So get you a little machinist ruler, machinist level. 
just run it down the tube. And you can see this is this is really not bad. That's shit less than a sixteenth. In the back. Wow, oh, we're dead on. Switch hands here. This side. I mean, we're real close. Real close there too. Something else you're gonna wanna keep track of that I forgot to mention earlier is these guys, you need to see what angle that they sit on with your housing. So before you go cutting apart, throw your angle finder on here. The easiest way to do these is uh, stick a couple bolts through. Oh God, oh God, there we go. Stick a couple bolts through, run something across it, set, you, set your angle finder on it and see what angle they're sitting in relation to your housing. This is gonna establish what angle your brakes are at. If it's drums, these are gonna be fairly important. Uh, if it's disc, well, if it's disc, you can set where you're gonna, we can clock where you're gonna put your caliper. So this one is disc and the caliper sit back here, but if you want to roll it towards the front for more like a road racing application, you'd figure out what angle you want to be at and then you could turn that and that would set your uh, caliper where it needs to be now this housing is amazingly straight i think i've had maybe two ever come out this straight especially with all the junk that was welded on this if you remember we had traction bar mounts here we had spring perches over here we had spring perches from whatever this came out of here uh, there were some other brake tabs and whatnot welded on there. When I got that guy cut off, there was actually another bracket underneath that that had been cut off. They didn't dress it out. They just welded more shit on top of it. So for as much as we cut off of this, this is amazing. Don't, I, I'm going to tell you, don't expect your housing to be this straight. And if it's not, that's fine. Say, let's say that this tailed up. If this tailed up, it's not the end of the world. All you're gonna do is you would heat it up right here and then quench it after you get it red hot. And what that'll do is it'll shrink it just a little bit and it'll pull that end down. And I mean, that's say it was tailed down, you heat the top, quench it, and that would pull it back up. Same for front and back. So if you get to this point and your housing's off a little bit, don't sweat it. Take a little heat, do a little heating, a little quenching, and you can pull those tubes where they need to be so that everything lines up again. This is not a real common thing, especially for as much as we, as much heat as we poured to this one. So, uh, let's get set up and do some welding. All right, time to weld now. now you see, I'm gonna put four good tacks all the way around this, and you'll notice after I get these four in, that I'm gonna grab that bar and I'm gonna give it a twist to make sure it's still spinning free. And you're gonna wanna do that after every time. So after I get the four tacks in, I'll check the bar, make sure it's still spinning free. Uh, I'll start burning in that root pass. And after I get that root pass in, I'll check it, make sure that bar is still turning free. You, you're really wanting to keep your heat even as you go around doing this, because you can actually pull those ends and it'll put a bind on everything. So you wanna keep you want to keep checking to make sure that that bar spins free the entire time. Uh, I'm running, I don't know, a 332nd tungsten, I think, probably about 150 amps. I'm, re I'm really burning in that root pass. I'm trying to push that weld through so that it's actually fusing the back side of that. Something I didn't show is I actually cleaned up the inside of those tubes. Uh, I hit them with a little bit of sandpaper and some acetone just to make sure that we didn't get any porosity that carried through the front side of the weld when we were burning in that root. Now, if you don't have a TIG, you can do this with a MIG. That's no big deal. I just, this is just how, I, how I've come to do it. I, I, I TIG everything, I'm an idiot. So, like I said, MIG's no issue, no problem. 
just make sure that these welds are as good to as close to perfect as you can get them because I mean it you know it's holding your whole car together so you don't want tires flying off while you're driving down the road Root passes are in. They hammered in pretty nice. Is this side? Let's see right there is where I dipped my tungsten and I had to stop. But for the most part, it came out pretty nice. Part still it spins nice and free. So now we'll go through, we'll put a cover pass on both sides and it's done. That's how you narrow a nine inch. Uh, once your welding's done, order your shafts, different places, different places want you to measure different ways. Uh, we're going to order curry shafts for this and they measure from this edge to here. So we had to have the housing finished before we could order shafts. That'll change depending on whose shaft you're gonna run, who you're gonna order from. So just get on their website, see how they want you to measure them, make sure that you do it exactly the way they want it. But other than that, we're ready to weld on some brackets, throw us back under the car. And that my friends is how you narrow a four nine inch.